We're going to talk to Ambassador Sheffer about the question, how should the international community address war crimes in Ukraine and beyond? Uh, before we get to that, we have a quick video from Wasim Mukhtad, a Syrian musician and torture survivor. Uh, he was tortured by officials in the Syrian regime uh, who will share his experiences with us uh, now. In the time of war or conflict, in the time of pain and death, I believe music and culture uh, gains a unique place because um, there is the expression part of it, but there is also the communication part of it. And by communication, there is the musicians with each other, the musicians with the audience, and the musicians with the history. Wasim Mukdad is a musician and doctor from Syria. He was an activist. He escaped the regime where he was captured and tortured, made his way to Germany where he's having a, a fine career as an oud player musician. And he was also an important witness in a case against the man who tortured him in one of the rare instances of, of uh, post-conflict justice. This guy was sentenced to life in prison and he was caught in Germany. He's in jail now. And so Wasim's testimony was an important part of that case. And he's known all over the world for that. His picture was in newspapers everywhere. I understand war as a human activity. A human activity to achieve superiority against the others. Culture in general, and music in particular, is a cooperation activity. So it's, in my sense of view, or point of view, it's exactly the opposite of what conflict and war has to offer. So it's an act of resistance, but in a very delicate way. Music for me is a way to heal those scars. Music for me is a way to share those painful memories. Music for me, it's a way to laugh at my pain, to laugh in the face of my pain, because I need to live with it. Those memories are there. Ambassador Sheffer, thank you for joining us. As you, as you know, Daniel Rothenberg and Alex Stark had pressing personal issues, and so we're not able to be part of this panel. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to uh, tell the audience that if you have a question for uh, Professor uh, Ambassador Sheffer, uh, there's a question mark um, on the upper right-hand part of your screen where you can submit questions. Um, so the first question I had, sir, is what... What atrocity crimes have been committed in Ukraine? Well, one could credibly argue that four baskets of crimes, in fact, have been committed. Atrocity crimes comprise of war crimes, which we're familiar with, of military to military crimes, but uh, that violate the laws of war and the proper conduct on the battlefield. But of course, war crimes can also include military assaults on civilians and and and. Uh, assaults on prisoners of war, etc. Then there's crimes against humanity, which is a very widespread assault on a civilian population. It can take place in war. It can also take place in, in peacetime when there is no armed conflict, but a government decides to actually assault part of its own population in a widespread, um, uh, uh, very injurious assault that can result in death, destruction of property, etc. Um, <clears throat> we've seen all of that take place in Ukraine. Then there is the crime of aggression, which is actually the initial crime that occurred. And that's the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, uh, Russian military. And that was a massive crime that commenced on February 24th of 2022. But of, 
There's also the argument that, frankly, the crime of aggression commenced in 2014 when Russian uh, forces and you know sort of disguised uniforms actually uh, invaded Crimea, and ultimately Crimea was uh, purportedly annexed by Russia. Um, so I, I think the argument for aggression can reach back to 2014. Um, and then finally, um, there's genocide. And while people may think, isn't that just too, uh, too large a crime with too much specific intent to destroy all or part of a particular protected group, such as the national group of Ukrainians, it, has that red line actually been crossed in Ukraine? And many of us argue that there are aspects of genocide that have been crossed, particularly the incitement to genocide. That's a component part of the crime of genocide. And that will play out uh, in coming months as, as the entire conflict uh, is, is analyzed. But we should not take genocide off of the table either. So there are four baskets of crimes. You know, it, it, during Nuremberg, the crime of aggression was also part of the charge sheet as well as genocide. Is that correct? Uh, well, yes, at Nuremberg, aggression, which was called crimes against peace at Nuremberg, um, was actually considered by prosecutor Robert Jackson, the U.S. prosecutor at Nuremberg, to be the primary crime that would be prosecuted at, uh, at Nuremberg. Um, and yet, by the end of Nuremberg, the, what we what the Nuremberg statute didn't have the crime of genocide at that time because it didn't technically exist until the genocide convention a couple of years later, but uh, it was it was clearly part of crimes against humanity, uh, a widespread assault on a civilian population, um, and that actually seized more attention at Nuremberg, with the Holocaust being brought front and center in the courtroom. Uh, and while aggression was successfully prosecuted and uh, uh, Nazi officials were convicted on it, um, it was crimes against humanity, uh, which, which uh, seized so much attention. So the International Criminal Court, um, my understanding is Ukraine is, is not a member of the ICC. And does that complicate things? And of course, the U.S. has been very resistant to the ICC. Yeah. Yeah, Ukraine is not actually a member state of the International Criminal Court, and there are all, all sorts of domestic reasons why that never occurred. But um, it did exercise a right under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. It's called Article 12, subparagraph 3, in which a non-party state can actually request the court to seize jurisdiction over a particular situation of crimes and the, the, the government concedes the investigative powers to the ICC, which would investigate all parties to the conflict, including the Ukrainians themselves. Um, but Ukraine conceded that to the ICC in 2014 with the invasion of Crimea, reaffirmed it, um, and, uh, and certainly reaffirmed it for, for, uh, for this invasion of, of uh, February of of 2024. Um, so they have had the jurisdiction of the ICC investigating crimes on their territory um, that fall within the Russian uh, uh, you know, mandate with Ukraine um, since 2014. Uh, the United States is not a party to the court. Um, I had the honor of signing the statute, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court on behalf of President Clinton on December 31st of 2000. But subsequent to the Clinton administration, the uh, George W. Bush administration decided to withdraw from the, that, that signature, uh, even though it still technically is on the document. Um, and um, uh, we've gone through various phases of engagement with the ICC and support for the ICC from the sidelines. Typically under Republican administrations, it's been in opposition to the court under Democratic administrations. It's had a cooperative, engaging relationship with the ICC, and that includes the Biden administration. Uh, the, the ICC investigator, um, Cameron Khan, Kareem Khan, he mm -hmm. is um, 
I mean, he, he's on the ground investigating in Ukraine. And um, what is he doing? Well, he's been on the ground two or three times himself. Um, and of course, he has his ICC teams of investigators on the ground. The ICC has committed a, a substantial amount of resources, staff expertise to the Ukraine situation. Um, I think it's for the audience, it's important to note that never before in any conflict um, or, or situation of internal atrocities has there been so much investigative effort in such a short period of time uh, on uh, the investigation and prosecution of atrocity crimes as there is in Ukraine. This is truly an unprecedented heavy hit on investigation. And there are teams not only from the ICC, but also um, from uh, the European Union, um, from the United States. Um, uh, in fact, Arizona State University, uh, under the leadership of Professor Clint Williamson, um, uh, one of my successors as ambassador at large for war crimes issues, um, has been on the ground for months now. Uh, uh, undertaking investigations in Ukraine. So ASU can take uh, very considerable pride in that. Um, uh, and of course, the Ukrainians themselves are, uh, the prosecutor general's office is deeply involved with investigative efforts on the ground. It's interesting to note, Peter, that well, we've seen in the news, of course, the sudden rush into Russian-held territory, uh, particularly in the north part uh, near Kharkiv, um, Immediately after the, uh, the Ukrainians seized that territory within the last few days, uh, the war crimes investigators, particularly of the Ukrainian government, have rushed in to investigate uh, crimes on the ground uh, in a very uh, real-time basis because, of course, those crimes would be associated with the Russian military, which would have just left. So it's a prime time uh, to actually conduct those investigations. So... Will there be special courts that will need to be um, built? I mean, I, I think when Saddam Hussein was um, tried, right. uh, you know, there was a special uh, court system. Uh, that's right. um, go ahead. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's because there was no international court that had jurisdiction over Iraq uh, during that period of time. Uh, and also the Iraqi national courts were not particularly equipped for the prosecution of atrocity crimes. So a special Iraqi tribunal was created, but that was a national Iraqi uh, uh, court that was created for that purpose with some international assistance. In this case, there will be quite a collection of courts that will be seized with Ukrainian prosecutions. First and foremost, of course, is the Permanent International Criminal Court under uh, Prosecutor Kareem Khan. Um, but remember, that's the ICC is very much a top leadership prosecution court. There will not be that many defendants. Uh, they will go to the top, generally speaking, um, to find their, uh, the perpetrators who they want to actually prosecute. You want to look to um, uh, other courts, such as national courts. The Ukrainian courts themselves will, for years uh, in, a, uh, in the future, be prosecuting the, the more mid-level and, and low-level uh, individuals for whom they can gain custody. Um, but then other national courts, such as in uh, Germany and other parts of Europe, um, uh, can exercise what we call universal jurisdiction to actually prosecute. This is exactly what you saw in the clip before our, our session in Syria. German courts were exercising universal jurisdiction uh, to prosecute a Syrian official. Why? Because the Syrian official was found on their territory, on German territory, so they could get custody. Once they got custody, then they exercised universal jurisdiction. This means that Russians in particular who were involved with this conflict uh, will probably be very smart not to travel around anywhere uh, because they will be subject to apprehension and then prosecution. The final thing I want to just say on this, Peter, is that for the crime of aggression, which is really the massive crime that occurred here in the invasion of uh, Ukraine, and all the other crimes are sort of subunits of this large crime of aggression, um, the ICC does not have jurisdiction over that crime for very technical reasons, which I, I don't need to go into here, but the point is you will not see that crime prosecuted by the ICC. So uh, many of my colleagues and I have been involved in developing a, a um, 
a concept for the, the creation of a special tribunal on aggression that, uh, in our case, uh, in the model that we're developing, would involve a treaty between the UN General Assembly and the government of, of Ukraine, just like we did for Sierra Leone, for the Special Court for Sierra Leone, for the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia. Those were treaty courts between the UN and the respective government. That would be the model here. Um, and we've had lots of discussions about this. And uh, at some point that the crime of aggression must be on deck. Is there any chance that Putin or other sort of leaders um, will actually see the inside of a courtroom? You know, it's, it's very problematic that we'll actually see Putin and the senior Russian leadership, military and political involved with this, uh, con uh, with this uh, war and the, and the cross street crimes. Um, actually be seized into, you know, be arrested and brought into a courtroom, whether it be in The Hague, in Kiev, in Berlin, wherever. Um, why? Because, uh, frankly, they will be indicted. I mean, they will have indictments hanging over them. I'm, I'm, I'm certain that's going to happen. Uh, Vladimir Putin will more than likely be indicted by the International Criminal Court. Um, I just say that as a matter of in, I mean, of, of objective analysis, <laughs> that that will probably happen. Uh, but they will have to remain in Russia to avoid apprehension. They will not be able to travel, but they will be ostracized internationally. Um, but you never know. The, the Ukrainian courts, for example, do have the right to prosecute in absentia, so they could follow through with trials in, in Ukraine um, and actually reach convictions of these individuals who remain, um, um, you know, protected by their presence on Russian territory. Would that subject them to an Interpol red notice or something like that? Yeah, if they step off Russian territory, that's what would happen. It would be a red notice and, and any government would be entitled then to take them down. I suppose their scope of travel might be limited to uh, Iran, Belarus, North Korea, and the People's Republic of China. I doubt any four of those governments would actually honor such a red notice. You know, as you're talking about the crime of aggression, how does the the, the U.S. Uh, invasion of Iraq sort of figure in the, in all this? Yeah, uh, you know, there's there's hypocrisy that that swings back and forth on these issues, as you know, Peter, and um, the invasion of Iraq did not have Security Council authorization. Um, and uh, the, the best argument that could possibly be made, but it's, it's a very shallow one, is that uh, somehow the United States and the United Kingdom, who joined us in that invasion, were exercising some kind of right of self-defense because they were seeking the nuclear uh, weapons that they thought were there. Obviously, a very shallow argument that proved to have no substance to it. And so um, the crime of aggression uh, did not technically, um, it didn't have a forum back in 2000, what was that, 2003, um, because the International Criminal Court, although it did exist at that time, the crime of aggression was not operationalized until uh, many years later, 2010, uh, at, through an amendment to the Rome Statute. So there was, no, there was no actual forum that said we prosecute the crime of aggression at that time. But theoretically, or as an academic, you could certainly make the argument that the United States and the United Kingdom um, really took a, a legal risk in, in uh, entering Iraq under the, under the reasons, or one might even say pretenses, that they did. Yeah, John Bolton has uh, famously said that the happiest day of his life is when he pulled the U.S. out of the International Criminal Court. At that time, yeah. he was at the State Department. Yeah. Um, you know, so uh, you, I think you alluded to this earlier. I mean, uh, the U.S. Mm -hmm. views about the ICC have sort of waxed and waned over the years. Where is it, you know, now now with this Ukraine war, uh, part in its seven month of, uh, right. sort of where where are we now? Yeah, that uh, that happiest day for Mr. Bolton was when he thought he removed my signature from the Rome statute, but 
a legal opinion from the legal counsel's office at the UN thereafter actually stated that no, it's still there, fully fine. And um, it just has an asterisk next to it saying that uh, Bolton's letter had been filed with the United Nations. Um, and I would hope someday that President Biden could simply uh, uh, put a second asterisk saying uh, the, the, the letter yeah, is not okay. by the no, US. Can you hear? All right. Uh, now, uh, but in terms of your question, Peter, um, the Biden administration under, uh, you know, the new U.S. ambassador at large for war crimes issues is, uh, is uh, Beth von Schock. And um, she has had a long history of academic work on the International Criminal Court and is, of course, now in a position of, of authority to communicate with the court, um, to see that the United States um, can be of assistance as far as possible under U.S. law. Um, it's, uh, it's very important to note that under the, uh, the, the Ukraine invasion has sort of unlocked some of the doors of apprehension about the ICC in the United States. There was a Senate resolution adopted, I believe, in April of 2022, um, which uh, has uh, the support of a large number of conservative Republican senators, all heralding the intervention of the International Criminal Court to investigate the atrocity crimes on the ground and supporting that. Uh, and there's other legislation on the Hill to further strengthen U.S. assistance in the sense of uh, uh, that, that, that they would have a, a way of assisting in the investigations in Ukraine and certainly support, um, a, a, if only diplomatically, the work of the International Criminal Court. So all of the signals uh, in light of the Ukraine invasion, Peter, uh, have been quite positive uh, with respect to the Biden administration's and Congress's relationship and and uh, commitment to the work of the International Criminal Court, at least with respect to Ukraine. I think we have to broaden our prism on that and understand that the ICC also is investigating many other situations of atrocities around the world. And of course, other countries and peoples that are sub subject to those atrocity crimes do deserve the attention of 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 investigators with respect to those crimes as well. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sheffer, for uh, uh, really giving us a, a very enlightening uh, tour to horizon uh, about this issue.